music and neuroscience, I believe now. So um, Cordelia, go outside to the stage. One on music. Put the white first thing. So, how's everyone doing? <laughs> I'm actually, uh, I had some music that I was going to play at the beginning, but I just feel like Calvin did such a great job, I can't follow it. So, I am going to skip, if I can, really quickly over this. Great. Okay, I think that's sorted. Um, so, we were all, I think everyone was kind of milling in and out, but everyone was able to listen into Calvin's show in the lunchtime break, and I think everyone really enjoyed it, myself included. It's so nice to listen to music in a group, again, with people that are sharing the same space in the same room. It feels incredible. And we were talking earlier that it just feels amazing to be able to see the backs of people's heads again. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that in itself is amazing, but there are so many amazing things that happen when we listen to music. Um, some of these are things that happen just technically, so the way that music comes into your brain in itself is incredible. But it's also all the different ways that your brain processes music. And that's what I want to talk about today, because I think that there are some really uh, valuable takeaways that we can gain if we consider the effect that music has upon the brain. But first, uh, I do want to look at the actual kind of auditory processing side. If the remote's going to work, okay, here it is. So this is a, a kind of visual processing, auditory processing GIF that I found on the internet. And you can see here, you have sound entering into the ear canal. So the vibrations that are created in the air when I speak or when music is played comes through your ear canal. It hits against your eardrum. That taps against these three tiny little bones right deep in your ear. That hits against the cochlea, which is this kind of snail shell. And within that, neurons are generated, and these neurons travel out through your auditory nerve and into your brain. That happens at a rate of one neuron traveling through into your brain per millisecond. That is so fast. And if we compare it to the way that visual imagery is processed, visual imagery travels into your brain at a rate of one neuron per 40 milliseconds. So auditory processing is 40 times as fast as visual processing. So that in itself is incredible. And then what happens next, I find to be even more so. So music enters into your brain, and it is processed by your temporal lobe. And this is the part of the brain that controls language and everything about language. And that includes the kind of auditory processing of language. And this happens. Uh, really quickly, and this is the part at which your brain makes sense of the noise around you. So you know that I'm speaking, you know that I'm not screaming, you know that I'm not the sound of a car, you know that you don't need to be scared, I hope. <laughs> um, and this is all happening in tenths of milliseconds, so, so quick. And once the sound has been processed, if you're listening to music, then it's very likely that this tiny, tiny part of your brain here, the nucleus accumbens is going to be activated. This is where your dopamine receptors are. And so if you listen to a piece of music and you enjoy it, or you have any kind of visceral response to it, it's because dopamine is being released. And this is the pleasure hormone. This is what gives you goosebumps when you listen to a piece of music that you like, or one that you haven't heard in a long time, something that brings back memories. Your cerebellum, this kind of bit at the back of your brain is activated. And this is the bit of your brain which is activated when you want to move to music. When you hear a piece of music and you want to kind of nod your head or tap your feet. This is the kind of physiology of music. And then your hippocampus. And this is something that Ira talked about in her keynote speech, which was fascinating. And it really ties into some of the ideas that I uncovered in looking into neuroscience and education and neuroscience and music. And the hippocampus is just so vital to the way that we learn. 
because it is the learning center of the brain. This is your memory center. This is where the deep learning happens. And this is the reason, the hippocampus, why if you have Alzheimer's and you're in the last stages of your battle with Alzheimer's, you're much more likely to remember the words to happy birthday than you are to remember the names of your family members. Music hits something so deep within our learning centers, within our memory centers. And finally, the last part of the brain that I want to show you explicitly is the amygdala. And this tiny little part of the brain, this is where the emotions lie. And this is what I want to focus on today, the emotional side of music, because I think it is so important. And it is so uh, unexplored in a way, because we've only recently had the ability to look through MRI scanning, through neuroimaging technology, at what actually happens in the brain when we listen to music. And what we've learned by looking at MRI scans, acute neuroimaging, is that emotion happens not just in different parts of the brain, not just all across it, but also at different depths as well. So you can see in this picture, you have the brain stem right at the bottom of your brain. And this is the part of your brain that evolved first. So this is one of the very first evolutionary parts of your brain. And this deals with kind of visceral responses to stimuli. So this has been called the lizard brain in the past, and you might have come across that. And then the next kind of level up is the limbic system. This is one of the uh, kind of mid-evolutionary parts of the brain. This is where your emotions are processed. Um, this is where your hormones are released from. And then the next part is the prefrontal cortex. This is the most kind of evolutionarily recent part of your brain. And this deals with complex decision making uh, and the ability to distinguish factors in a very kind of advanced way. And that's something that is specific to humans. And the emotion that is induced by music hits every single one of those layers. And I want to just look at some quickly because there are eight different emotion mechanisms of inducing emotions. And I'm gonna look at just several because we don't have that much time. But first one is... This one. And I saw some of you kind of springing awake again after a, after a big lunch. So uh, <laughs> this is the brainstem reflex. And this hits the very base part of your brain, which is to do with attention. And loud noises, uh, noises that are unexpected, they hit this part of your brain, which is basically saying, oh my god, do I have to run? You don't, you're fine, it's safe. Um, Ain't no and this is the process of your heart literally changing speed depending on the beat and the rhythm of the music that you're listening to. So a song like Ain't No Sunshine by Bill Withers sits right in the middle of the average BPM of your heart rate. But if you listen to a song with a really fast tempo, your heart rate will literally increase. It won't meet that tempo, but it will rise. And if you listen to a song which is slower, then your heart rate will decrease. And this is a really powerful tool. And this is where we start coming into how we can utilize music in an education environment, because you can create atmospheres by utilizing rhythmic entrainment. You can calm down by listening to slower music or you can motivate by listening to more fast-paced music and that's the reason why one of the things that athletes cite as being most effective before they go and perform is listening to something that really motivates them a piece of music that is fast-paced because it gets them hyped up and it gets them ready to go out and perform to their best and then we have emotional contagion Your brain makes sense of the subconscious elements of music that make it maybe happy, maybe less so. So in Mad World by Gary Jules, this song is a minor key. It's very slow paced. And the timbre, the way that the instruments and the voice sound are perceived by the human brain as evoking a certain type of emotion. And that emotion is often described as melancholy or sadness, as opposed to... Uh... 
And this is actually, this is not even, it's not really operating at a conscious level of the brain. If you listen to the lyrics of I want to dance with somebody, they're actually kind of sad. <laughs> but everything that happens in the instrumentation and the performance, that amazing performance of the vocal line, makes it so uplifting in a way that gets people singing along, gets people moving. So how can we use this? What relevance has music to learning? Well, emotion is increasingly being cited as one of the best ways uh, to facilitate deep learning and to create an environment within which students feel confident and empowered and want to share. Um, and it's not only the kind of holistic aspect, this kind of positivity within a classroom. There are, I mean, there is research that shows that these networks the emotion networks and the learning networks are fundamentally intertwined with each other. So essentially, there is evidence to suggest that we can learn faster, we can remember longer if we utilize music within the classroom. And this is something which is really recent. All of this evidence comes from you know, fairly, fairly recent years. I mean, I think the last five years um, worth of studies about the use of music in the classroom. And so it's very experimental. And one of the reasons that I wanted to present today is because I wanted to have a conversation with you. We have academics here, we have students here, we have members of all different parts of different teams at Bloomsbury Institute. And I wanted to try and see what your thoughts were about this, because I think it's something that we can work together to make into a fundamental aspect of parts of our curricula. And not just because I think it's fun, but because I think it's important to the way that our students feel connected to this institution as well. Um, creating a positive environment within a classroom setting can prevent alienation from higher education. And that's something that we constantly work towards at Bloomsbury Institute. We are constantly trying to include students in all different ways, as many different ways as we can, and suiting as many different needs as we can as well. So we need to be working to expand a kind of toolkit of strategies that can engage different learners in different ways and for different purposes, encouraging diversity at all levels of the institution, not just in our students, not just in our staff, but at the very pedago pedagogical point. Pedag pedagogical. <laughs> so how are we going to do this? How are we going to implement this pedagogy? Well, I mean, I've had some preliminary ideas, but I've only been working on this research for about two months. So. Obviously, there are passive ways that we can use music in the classroom, and I've had conversations with people who say, well, I do this, I, I listen, I play music, and students listen. So there are different ways that we can utilize this kind of passive state. We can play it while students are working individually, when they're working in groups, maybe even just when entering and exiting to create a certain environment or a certain state within the classroom. But I would argue that there are also ways that we could be more active with our inclusion of music. This may be controversial, but I think that we could incorporate music into the curricula as well because there is such a wealth of socio-political information and data within music that I think is so important to facilitate discussion. There is even the potential now with uh, Bloomsbury Radio, our amazing radio station, being so intertwined with the institution itself to create multimedia assessments as well and utilize those ties. So who could we become if we learn with music? Who could we become if we teach with music? Well, I think we could become more confident learners. We could become more fulfilled educators maybe more active and creative educators. And overall, I think that we could all become a more engaged group of human beings. And that is where I'm going to end. Thank you very much.